my talk will be of a completely different character and it was really part of the planning that we should have Christopher talk on Chickold who is at the centre of uh, our exhibition and our symposium today and yet he is also to some extent absent in that the exhibition was planned to be about his collection which is in many respects a survey of the uh, most innovative modernist graphic design in Central and Eastern Europe of the 1920s and early 30s. And that's really what I'm going to go over now to look at to some extent the, the institutional environment in which the uh, new typography developed which is less to do with individual designers and more with groupings, with organisations, with journals and with societies. And for that I want to focus in some respects on some of the major features of the period. And let me see if I can work this. Ah, good. So what I want to begin with is to affirm the central position that the Bauhaus plays in the uh, laying the foundations for what became the new typography. Of course, as we've just heard, Chichold visited this exhibition in Weimar in 1923, which was a very important moment in the history of the Bauhaus and indeed in the history of modernism in Central Europe, which might be regarded as that transition from an earlier craft-based expressionist aesthetic towards one that was more closely aligned with constructivism and indeed with the repertoire of abstract forms that was widely believed to be suitable for industrial production. Now it's indeed at that exhibition and in the catalogue which you can see here that the Hungarian constructivist Laszlo Mahoy Nudge first coined this term Die Neue Typographie in a very short essay, one can hardly call it more than a speculative set of ideas about what typography may be able to do in the catalogue to the exhibition. This was just about Mohoy's first contribution to the Bauhaus. He had only been employed in the institution for about two months before he wrote this and indeed designed the catalogue. He also designed the prospectus, which you can see on the bottom left, uh, but not the cover, which was designed by Herbert Bayer, a student in the Bauhaus at the time. And this prospectus, and indeed the catalogue, is a fairly good example of the way in which Mahoy regarded typography and layout. And as we've just heard, it should be emphasised that Mahoy had never studied typography. And indeed, he had very little knowledge of the practices and processes of printing. At this stage, all he'd done was print his own lino cuts. But as was quite well known at the time, as a true avant-gardist, Mahoy believed in pushing the boundaries and thinking through the potential of each medium and each technology. For that reason, this catalogue is really a very important introduction to the whole area of the new typography. And indeed, it did help to set the scene for Bauhaus projects over the next few years. Indeed, one of the first things he went on to produce was new letterheads for the director and indeed for the institution as a whole. They are relatively easy, cheap, but very effective way of establishing a distinct identity. After all, it's merely printed on paper. And one of the things that we've discovered about the Bauhaus at that stage was that they had very limited funds, but almost unlimited supplies of paper. 
one of the features of this was that when they uh, went to the uh, tried to revive the print workshop, which I'll come back to, they also found a large cache of extremely good quality paper, which was valued at five times the value placed on the printing presses, which is rather interesting. And therefore, the uh, Bauhaus was able to communicate a sense of its new direction and identity purely through the printed paper that was being used to communicate with students, collaborators, clients, suppliers and such like. And these, uh, this was um, Mahoy Nudge's uh, letterhead on the left and Herbert Beyer slightly later. Beyer had graduated from being a student to joining the Masters in 1925. And indeed it was largely through Mahoy Nudge that the uh, Bauhaus was able to introduce uh, the, one of the most progressive and comprehensive campaigns of uh, publication which not only the subject matter, but the appearance and feel of these books was an expression of the underlying ideas that would come to be codified by Chichold and others as the new typography. You can see a selection of the uh, covers on the left, the prospectus of the first tranche at the top and the centre, the uh, title page of um, Gropius's volume, the first volume in the series, and at the bottom probably now the most famous book in the whole series, Mahoy Nudge's own painting, photography, film, which was again utilising many of the elements that Mahoy had already advocated. Bold use of uh, rules to break up the uh, page, sans serif lettering, which was organised in asymmetrical forms and in many cases, although not on this page, using multiple directions of type. Now this series, which ran right through till 1930, uh, was, as I've suggested, one of the most comprehensive and radical expressions of these new ideas. And yet, when we look back or look beneath the surface of these paper expressions of the Bauhaus, just what kind of typography and graphic design was taught there? Look back at the catalogue from 1923. This was the print workshop. They had three hand presses, one of which for most of this period was inoperable. It's also one of the cruder hand presses, probably a version, the German version of the Washington press, which was used by most printers for proofing, not for printing. And indeed that tells us quite a lot about what the Bauhaus saw the print workshop producing during this period, because what they were primarily printing was artists' prints for the portfolios, the Mappe series. The person in charge of that print workshop was Feininger, who had no experience of typography or, for that matter, really of graphic design, having worked as a printmaker, cartoonist and a range of other activities. One wonders what Chichold saw when he came to the Bauhaus in 1923, having trained in a series of trade schools with some of the more advanced contemporary equipment for printing in a variety of processes and to different standards. Therefore, when we look at what Chichold drew from this, I would tend to emphasise that it's the inspiring ideas and the model of a new type of design which was being presented, rather than the teaching or training of potential designers. It should be remembered that graphic design, verbigraphic as it was called, did not go on to the Bauhaus curriculum until 1928, by which stage, as far as I can see, 
five other German colleges already had classes and re-equipped studios of graphic design. Above all, in Frankfurt, in Munich itself, and in a number of other colleges. Now, I'll come back to that in a moment, because what we do know is uh, that Chichold emerged from the, uh, his experience at the Bauhaus and was certainly inspired to begin campaigning for a new type of graphic design and typography, which achieved its uh, first full expression in the uh, special issue of typographische Mitteilung, and that we might be seeing quite a lot of this today, but um, I apologise. Uh, there's a very good, uh, in fact, one of Chichold's own copies on exhibition uh, in the gallery. And this, as you can see, uh, published in 1925, is quite an interesting document in itself. It's remarkable that a journal produced monthly by the Union of German Printers and Book Designers should be handed over to a 23-year-old <laughs> to design and to present the contents as he thought best. And this gives some indication of the types of work that he was uh, producing. This is also from the period which you will notice just up here, when he was Ivan Chichold having become familiar at least with the work of El Lysitsky, with whom he began a long and very affectionate correspondence for the remainder of their lives, respectively. But the, to look at the interior of elementary uh, or elemental typography, you can see how the texts, the layout, and the choice of inks, etc., are by their very nature both an expression of these new ideas in both form and content. Now, from this, Chichold developed his uh, statements on the new design. And I'm not going to go through them. This is, these are not uh, direct translations. This is my... Uh, this is Chichold for children. Uh, <laughs> the ten great statements that he believes should be the watchwords and guiding principles of the new design. And indeed, one of the things that Chichold certainly took from the avant-garde circles which he was mo beginning to move in is that many of the new ideas about uh, constructivism came armed with a huge repertoire of theory and social justification, which is why his writings at this time are frequently very dogmatic, but also rather inspiring. He talks about uh, the purpose of typography is communication. The message must appear in its shortest, simplest and most urgent form. We can see that he is seeking to communicate very firmly and powerfully some of the ways in which modern typography engages with contemporary life, which is increasingly uh, shaped as much by advertising and an insistent form of, of uh, communication. I'm not going to go through these in uh, sequence, you'll be pleased to hear, but I'll uh, show you the remaining uh, five just to bring you up to date. But I think it is quite important, as we've heard already, that he was absolutely clear that on certain points there was, at this stage in his career, there was no compromise on areas like ornament. That was absolutely inadmissible. And indeed, that it, all the new forms should be should conform to industry standards and such like. But he is also still committed to the ideals of typography as part of a constant or permanent revolution, as he sums up in his final point that in typography, as in other fields, elemental design is never absolute or definitive typographic design will constantly change. Now, what's quite remarkable about this, I would suggest, is not that statement, sorry, this publication, is that the union was at this stage going through something of a 
golden period. What had been in the after the First World War, uh, the Printers Union had a membership of somewhere in the early, uh, in the low 20,000s. By 1929, we know that there were around 85,000 members of that Printers Union. And that union was also one of the principal patrons of modern architecture and design. This was their new headquarters, designed by Max Tout, opened in 1926, just after uh, Chickold had published elemental typography. And indeed, this building had been opened with a very interesting publication on the architect, written by Adolf Bene and Johannes Maltzan, someone who would become a correspondent of Chickold. Bauten und Plane is, by, by any standards, one of the great examples of modernist typography of the 1920s and also uses photography and architectural photography in particular in a very interesting way. Now, it is the same group, therefore, the same organisation, who will go on to publish Die Neue Typographie, a union which is committed, therefore, to a social programme and also the most radical principles of contemporary graphic design. And indeed, this book, which we've heard already, would become the standard text. While elemental typography was full of rather grand statements drawn from uh, manifestos and a political programme, Die Neue Typographie was much more clearly planned as it was, as its subtitle says, as a handbook for designers. It's therefore full of advice, guidance, information about how to design in certain ways. And as would be appropriate for a union, it could go into the hands of every apprentice and practicing printer in the country and not remain purely in the rather rarefied environment of an art gallery or an avant-garde journal. That's why, as Christopher pointed out, it's actually quite a small and easily portable book and with very simple, straightforward materials. Now, indeed, the, the, this indicates also something of these institutional parties or players in the development of the new typography, because their journal would continue to be one of the principal mouthpieces of modern typography. And here's a series of the covers from around the same time, which again indicates their adherence to asymmetry to sans-serif typefaces and to a simplicity in organisation which is appropriate for practitioners of design but at the same time does not deviate from the newfound principles of the new typography. And this is in marked contrast to certain other journals. One of the journals that's very famous in this period is Offset partly because in 1926 there was a special issue devoted to the Bauhaus with a cover by Hust Schmidt, who would go on later to become the uh, master of the Bauhaus print studio. But that's a very unusual issue. Most of the other covers and contents of Offset are, if not anti-modernist, let's just say un uh, unsuited to the new typography and indeed in many cases a quite a conventional journal. The same could be said of the leading graphic design journal of that period, Gebrauchsgraphik, which um, often did have modernist but it would appear was not particularly sympathetic to the most radical tendencies. Indeed, Gebrauch's graphic written into its agenda when it was first launched in the early 1920s was claimed that its editor, Frenzel, who was an important promoter of graphics and contemporary design, said that the journal would have to represent the full spectrum of the 
trade and industry. It was therefore not a mouthpiece for the avant-garde and the modern uh, movement. Instead, one which did seem to be take up the new typography much more effectively was the Deutsche Werkbund's journal, Die Form, which in its early manifestation was actually quite a rather bland, traditional looking uh, journal, uh, which actually only ran for about a year in 1922 to 23. It folded, but when it was relaunched in 1925, was given not only a new cover with a very strong asymmetrical uh, design with very bold sans serif letter forms. In the first year, many of the leading figures of the new typography, including Walter Dexel, Johannes Maltzan, Willy Baumeister, and others, would all write for Deform. And indeed, in 1928, Deform held a competition to redesign the cover. And each of these figures, all members of the ring, whom I'll come to in a moment, submitted entries for the competition, including Chico, for that matter. But it was indeed Walter Dexel who uh, won the competition and his uh, version of the cover, which remained in existence for at least another uh, eight years, it's at least another six years, sorry, uh, utilised many of the principles that Chichold had already advocated. Asymmetry, sans serif type forms, and the use of photography for illustration. Now, this was, to some extent, already becoming a, a polarised environment in which certain journals certain groupings were holding on to traditional values in design and particularly in printing, while others were wholeheartedly committed to the new uh, uh, principles advocated by Chichold and his contemporaries. And one of these, definitely the circle around Ernst May in Frankfurt, which is often collectively known as Das Neue Frankfurt, which was a programme as much as a journal. And this uh, was their journal. I think it was very interesting that a journal that was for the residents of the new housing schemes of Frankfurt should every month be getting uh, a magazine on things like Russian film or new developments in photography and the theories of Russian suprematists, which is rather impressive, I always felt. But look at the covers, designed by the brother and sister uh, Hans and Greta Lestikov, um, which is one of the finest expressions, I think, of these new ideas with really radical um, uh, photo montages. Um, now this was part of a larger programme which Lestikov was able to, um, the, the Lestikovs, but particularly Hans, could bring to uh, bear on the everyday and the cultural events that were promoted by the City Council of Frankfurt. So again, I'm wanting to draw attention to almost a pattern in the, in the commissioning and support for the modern or the new typography that does not remain within a narrow uh, middle class or elitist group. In fact, it is taken up by unions, by town councils and by a range of other forms. Now, what we can see from this is that the, the new typography may have been rich in possibilities, but it lacked coherence. Kurt Schwitters at this point and Robert Michel proposed forming an association with a quote of like-minded designers. Schwitters immediately set about contacting various figures he knew of, and by December 1927 he could claim, and I quote, we are now firmly established with nine members. These are Vordenberger Gildewerk, myself, Georg Trump, 
Max Burkhardt, Michel, Willy Baumeister, Jan Chichold, Walter Dexel and César Domela. We already have two magazines and five exhibitions. That's a lot for the beginning. Well, in fact, they didn't have two magazines and they didn't have any exhibitions, but it sounded good. And by January, therefore, all that they needed, 1928, was a name. And they called themselves the Ring Neue Werbegestalter, the Ring of New Advertising Designers. Now, many of these designers had known one another for some time, especially those who'd been part of constructivist art circles, such as the Group at K uh, in the early 1920s. Schwitters took on the role of secretary and general factotum, or to be more precise, these duties were undertaken by Helma, his wife. Schwitters also wrote to printers, editors and curators, with a view to creating opportunities for the group. It was still unclear what the ring would do. After all, the members were spread across Germany in various cities and towns, and there were no clear aims. No programme, no calendar of events. What did emerge from the initial letter-writing campaign was the prospect of exhibitions. After that, a simple set of rules was laid down, setting out subscriptions, the number of works each member could submit, and the possibility of creating an archive of photographs and design work. The next stage was to invite foreign or corresponding members, thus enlarging the group and emphasising its international stature. Again, the circle was expanded mostly by people with whom the members were already in touch. Chichold proposed Lajos Kasak, the Hungarian constructivist, El Lisitsky, Karol Teige, the Czech modernist, and Piet Zwart, the one of the greatest of the graphic designers of this period, based in the Netherlands. These were all designers whom Chickold wanted to incorporate into Die Neue Typografie in any case. Zwart did in fact become the first foreign member, soon to be joined by Paul Skytema, another Dutch designer. Another, a number of others chose not to join the ring, but they were willing participants. These included John Hartfield and Carol Teige, but they were credited as guests. But other new members were proposed. Werner Greff, for example, Johannes Maltzan, Hans Lestikoff, and Theo van Dusburg. Schwitters conducted the group's activities in a fairly light-hearted way, sending out postcards, seasonal greetings, jokes, puns, ironic comments about contemporary printing and such like. He was keen to launch a journal, but given the passive role that most members preferred to play, the idea was probably over-ambitious. Nevertheless, it was suggested that the ring could use the journal Das Neue Frankfurt as a mouthpiece for their activities. Schwitters also reached out to the Bauhaus with the possibility of working with them. And here I meant to show you this to begin with. This was the, again, the Bauhaus's, uh, the Ring's launch into uh, a public face was not through any building or any exhibition, but through their headed notepaper. On the left, designed by Schwitters, and on the right, one of Jan Chickel's sequence of headed notepapers where you can see he adds at the top next to his name the ring, the ring, to again emphasise his membership of this. Now, Schwitters reaching out to the Bauhaus with the possibility of collaboration <coughs> proved to be something of a sore point between the two groups. Despite their shared ideals in design, Herbert Bayer and Hust Schmidt, the two people most closely involved with graphics at the Bauhaus, were rather frosty about any formal collaboration, as indeed they had been in 1925 when Chekhold reached out to them. <coughs> the official response from the Bauhaus 
for potential collaboration on publications and exhibitions is really somewhat high-handed. We do not disagree with your aims and stand firmly alongside your organisation, but instead of participating, we urge the current head of our advertising department and printing studio to join your association as a representative. We agree in principle to participate in your exhibitions on the condition that we are able to decide on our participation in each exhibition. And finally, for organisational reasons, we cannot accept a commitment allowing you to participate in our exhibitions. We will gladly, con gladly consider your participation in each specific case and wherever possible bring it about. This is a group that includes Chekhov, Schwitters, El Lisitsky, and a host of others being told by Herbert Bayer and Hust Schmidt that they might consider their participation. <laughs> Schwitters sent this round all the members in a round robin and uh, he kept the responses which were sent by the various members of the ring. Somewhat the the authors of each comment is not reported, but since there were only about 12 members, you can perhaps link uh, each statement to one or other of the members I talked of earlier. I don't think I'm not going to go through <laughs> all of this. Let's let you read that in itself. Now, the first exhibition of the ring opened in 1928 at the Kunstgewerbe Museum in Cologne. But from then on, this type of work went on tour, and indeed there were two parallel exhibitions, number with um, uh, probably somewhere in the region of about 70 to 80 works in each, and possibly more. We don't know, there was no clear uh, catalogue of these works, but all of these works that I'm showing you here were certainly represented because the second of the Rings exhibitions ended up in the Netherlands where it was ultimately absorbed into the Stedelijk Museum. And so I was rather interested to notice when looking through that material from the Stedelijk that uh, much of it was material also which Chickold acquired for himself and it made me think perhaps he was guided in his acquisitions partly by what the designers themselves had chosen to submit. So I'm just going to go through some of the works that were shown. These are uh, posters uh, and cards by Walter Dexel that were uh, exhibited in both of the ring exhibitions. There's a famous series of works related to the exhibition Die Wohnung by Willy Baumeister. Uh, Die Wohnung was, of course, the exhibition on interiors and furniture which corresponded to the Weisenhof Siedlung in uh, Stuttgart in 1927. These works by Piet Zwart, which we also have examples of in the exhibition, but particularly his work for the uh, Nederlandish Kabelfabriek, Fabriek, the cable factory manufacturer uh, in The Hague uh, and in Delft, which you, again we have ex examples of in the exhibition. And indeed these were uh, the pieces which Chichold had put into the second ring exhibition, Die Frau ohne Namen, his poster for the film, but also uh, the two examples of books in the series uh, photo, uh, the, the book of uh, 60 photos that he produced um, in uh, 1930. Now, of the others, we can see also that this became really one of the best surveys of contemporary graphic design. These works by Burkhardt, all in the exhibition, and by the corresponding members. Kashak was well represented, as was Tiger, and indeed in the Dutch contribution, Tiger was perhaps the largest single contributor of all, which I think is quite remarkable, given that he was not a full member. Interestingly enough, although they were invited to contribute, only Mahoy Nudge 
contributed substantially from the Bauhaus and it was predominantly his uh, designs for the lifestyle women's magazine, Die Neue Linie. Now, this perhaps indicates a different groupings approaching this. And indeed, if anything, it was this whole group was brought together when uh, in Gefeselter Blick was published in 1930. And this was a magazine partly sponsored by the Ring, so it's understandable that it would be uh, composed largely of Ring members. In fact, there are 26 designers uh, represented in uh, this uh, magazine and indeed uh, only one person from the Bauhaus was represented, Mohoi Nudge. And that point, from that point onwards indeed, the ring ceased to have any real power in the uh, as a group. They ran out of steam by 1931 and the individual members went off to organise exhibitions and to develop their own individual practice. It's of course at the same time when the Bauhaus is closed in Dessau, moves to uh, Berlin and never really re-establishes itself as a major force. What we, I would suggest from this is that, as we might expect, even amongst designers who share many of these ideas, there's a lot of interpersonal and interinstitutional rivalry, but that the Bauhaus produced a lot of very interesting theory, but very few examples of graphic design that would go on to uh, operate independently in the world, in the commercial world. Whereas in the case of the ring, almost every member was able to establish uh, the basis of a graphic design studio and practice. The ring and the Bauhaus are in many respects opposite sides of the same coin, which is one of the reasons why the new typography in Germany should be such a vital force and ultimately, I believe, should be the fountainhead of what became the true basis or the true principles of modernist graphic design, at least in Northern Europe. Thank you.